My talk's a little bit different than the ones you've just heard. Um, I'm going to just try to provide some context and perspective um, and how we sort of should interpret or think about uh, meta-analyses and some of the points I'll be making are very um, similar to what Dr. Gray just mentioned with respect to um, potential implications of the Katsanos meta-analysis for, I think, future regulatory action. So here are my disclosures. So uh, what is a meta-analysis? So, so if you go back to 1976, Dr. Glass published this, this paper where he actually defined this for us. This was at a time when we were just starting to do meta-analytic work, and he describes three types of analyses and data. Primary analysis, where you actually answer the original question. Secondary analyses, where you repurpose your data to answer a different question. And then finally, meta-analysis, which is basically combining a bunch of different analyses and, and putting quantitative uh, synthesis behind it. Now, as we all know, in the last 30 years, uh, the, there has been an explosion, exponential growth in the number of meta-analyses being, uh, being published. And this uh, is really probably due to two factors. One is rapid dissemination of data and computational tools that allow us to rapidly um, perform these analyses. Now, uh, this growth has not been met with, uh, has certainly been met with a lot of criticism. I think the prevailing sentiment is that a lot of meta-analyses are really not helping or advancing science, but actually adding some confusion and noise. Ioannidis put this paper together in 2016, where he actually suggested that only 3% of meta-analyses are decent and useful. He suggested 20% are flawed beyond repair, and he said 27% are redundant and unnecessary. So at least based on his interpretation, uh, results from modern-day meta-analyses are perhaps at best confusing and at worst, I would say, misleading. Nevertheless, uh, and, and to overcome this, there have been a lot of efforts, a uh, quorum statement, the PRISMA statement, there's even a registry now, so you have to register your meta-analyses, no different than you do for uh, clinical trials at clinicaltrials.gov. And so there's been a lot of effort to try to put some rigor, some standards, um, and approaches so we, can, so we can have meaningful conversations. Nevertheless, uh, there are certainly valid reasons to perform meta-analyses have already been mentioned uh, to study very rare outcomes. Our individual trials aren't often powered to detect uh, signals in events that are clinically meaningful, and I think a good example is stent thrombosis with coronary drug-eluting stents. Um, what about certain subgroups of interest? Uh, clinical trials generally underrepresent certain populations. Uh, women continue to be underrepresented, patients with renal impairment. And sometimes we need to confirm or refute subgroup findings. So in the second-generation DES um, original registration trials, there was a suggestion that perhaps these uh, devices weren't um, efficacious or safe in diabetics, and um, that sort of signal required meta-analytic analytic work to, to confirm or, or refute that. So how do we approach meta-analyses? As was just, uh, just discussed, the top uh, bullet point is the most common way. We basically aggregate the study level data. This is the most common. It's rapid. It's cheap. It's, it's efficient. We can do this pretty, pretty quickly. Individual patient level data is tough, but it's much more powerful because you can't get access to this data. But with these data, you can do at the time to event analyses, identify predictors, look at subgroup effects in a valid manner. Direct comparisons is what's most commonly done, but now we're seeing more and more indirect meta-analyses or network meta-analyses. This basically means that although a trial may have compared uh, drug A and drug B and others compared drug B to C, in your network approach, you can then compare drug A and C. And now we're seeing Bayesian meta-analyses also being uh, performed, which basically take into account prior assumptions or beliefs that you may or may not have, and then integrate that into posterior distributions um, for your hypothesis. So what are some things you want to think about when you look at any meta-analysis? Well, there's a lot. I've just put down a few that I think are, are meaningful and, and relevant. First is heterogeneity, and heterogeneity comes in two flavors. There's clinical heterogeneity, which is something you as the reader has to determine based on the type of patients enrolled, the methods, the follow-up. Then there's statistical heterogeneity, which is something we can quantify. Publication bias or selective reporting. Small study effects, and I think uh, as, uh, in Dr. Gray's talk, I think this is particularly relevant to the Katsanos meta analysis. The signal of most concern was that signal at five years with a hazard ratio of 1.9, and that's based on basically 105 events, which is a very small number. And then finally, how well conducted were the individual trials? How much uh, follow-up was con uh, what was the follow-up rate, um, blinding, how well did uh, participants adhere to the protocol, and so on and so forth. 
So I'm just going to walk through a couple of uh, representative examples of meta-analyses that I think illustrate some of these concepts when we are trying to interpret these and figure out whether or not we should actually uh, take these um, and, and change our practice as a result. So this is Ajay Kirtani's meta-analysis in Circulation 2009, where he studied the impact of DES versus bare metal stents. This is in, in coronaries. Um, on the left, he meta-analyzed randomized control trials. You can see uniform um, estimate of non-significance with very little heterogeneity. On the right, observational studies, over 180,000 patients where he detected almost a 25% reduction in mortality with DES. The purpose here is simply to uh, emphasize that just because you have more numbers and large uh, number of trials here in these observational studies, that does not eliminate the bias or the weakness in the, in the trials themselves. When you meta-analyze weak studies, you don't eliminate bias. If anything, you amplify the bias and you can confuse interpretation. What about this idea of inflated effects with small studies? Well, this is a, a nice paper um, where the uh, authors looked at a group of, uh, group of studies. On the x-axis is the total number of participants in the various trials. The y-axis is the deviation from the truth or the point estimates. And what you can see here in a very nice linear relationship, as the number of participants or events decreases, your signals or your treatment effects go up. This has been shown over and over. This is empiric. This is true for randomized trials. This is true for meta-analysis you are more likely to find a, a, an inflated estimate when you have small numbers or small study effects compared with larger numbers. And what about other features of your trials? There's been some, uh, some mention about the trials with the drug-coated balloons with respect to their follow-up and follow-up completion. So John Biddle uh, looked at the issue of DAP duration and all-cause mortality in this editorial. And on the left, he found when trials were stopped prematurely for, uh, for a variety of reasons, there was actually no evidence of harm with excess uh, prolonged DAP duration. But when you looked at the trials that completed their pre-planned enrollment, you actually found a signal for increased ha harm with prolonged DAP. So again, your inference and your interpretation of your meta-analysis is predicated on understanding the details of the studies with respect to their quality, the level of heterogeneity, and, um, and also the number of events and number of participants that were enrolled in the respective studies. So I want to just close with a couple of comments, and I, you know, as what's happening right now with, with, with this space and how think fast uh, things are evolving, uh, I'd like to go back to the story of rosaglitazone and just kind of propose that perhaps what we're seeing is analogous to what happened um, about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, now, there are some uh, clear differences. The issue with rosaglitazone, I think, had a lot more biological basis uh, behind it than what we're seeing with DCB and paclitaxel. Nevertheless, my purpose is simply to illustrate regulatory reactions to accumulating data. So rosaglitazone was approved by the FDA in 1999. It was approved based on relatively small studies, none of which were powered for cardiovascular endpoints, but rather to lower uh, serum glucose. We have a provocative meta-analysis in 2007, 42 studies. These were cl clinically heterogene uh, heterogeneous studies, limited follow-up, and there was a demonstration of increased risk for MI of 1.43. And here's the meta-analysis right here. So this generated immediate controversy. Lots of other papers get published. Some are in line with this. Some are not in line with this. Very similar to what we're seeing right now. Nevertheless, the Food and Drug Administration issues a black box warning in 2007. Several years later, they restrict sales um, of this drug, and um, as, as a result, uh, um, sales of rosaglitazone certainly uh, plummeted. In 2010, the FDA also mandated that the sponsor or the uh, manufacturer of this drug conduct um, a, an independent adjudication of one single large trial that was ongoing, the record trial. So this was a trial that was designed to study cardiovascular endpoints. It was meant to be powered for this using standardized definitions and follow-ups. Um, this was, again, uh, run by the manufacturer of rosaglitazone, but then it was independently adjudicated by Duke Clinical Research Institute. This is a slide um, that I actually got from the advisory panel's meeting in 2013, and this trial showed no increased risk for MI, hazard ratio of 1.13, and based on this independent um, analysis and other uh, data that were sort of consistent with this, um, the drug restrictions in 2013 were lifted by the FDA. So this took six years, but we did see how the FDA reacted. There was concerning signal, lots of confusing data was coming out, and finally the regulatory stance uh, took actually a trial, um, to uh, not only a trial, but uh, independent analysis to change their, um, change their stance, and uh, the label now simply states that the available data on the risk of MI are inconclusive. So, in conclusion, uh, meta-analyses is an increasingly common technique that allows us to rapidly synthesize data. 
Um, the inferences, however, from these meta-analyses are completely dependent on the quality, heterogeneity, and I think most relevant to this conversation is the size of the study and the number of events when you're evaluating your pool estimates. And there is certainly historical precedent from a regulatory perspective to, rest to restrict sales of FDA approved products and then await uh, results of large adequately powered trials before those positions are, are changed. So thank you.